All right, we're back. Welcome to the Comparing Clipboards podcast. I'm your host, Luke Lewis, here with my co-host, Erica Chapa. Erica, how are you doing today? So good. So excited. I feel like we're going to learn a lot of stuff today. I how think are we you? Are, I'm good. I think we are too. Uh, we're also joined here by um, current varsity baseball coach at Central Valley Christian High School, Shane Marshall. Shane, how are you doing today? I am better than I deserve to be, Luke. How are you? <laughs> I'm good. So little walkthrough on Shane here. So like I mentioned, Shane does coach varsity baseball at Central Valley Christian High School. He also attended there and graduated in 2014. After that, he walked on at Fresno Pacific, um, which was an NCAA Division II school in Fresno, California. There they won the 2015 NCCAA National Championship. Um, he began coaching at Fowler High School in 2017, where he was the assistant pitching coach and catcher's coach. And in 2018, he was the assistant coach as well as the head JV coach. Um, they won the CIF Central Section Champions. Shane got a ring for that. Um, then after that, he was hired back at Central Valley Christian, his alumni, as the head varsity coach in September of 2018. Um, his team has improved very greatly since then. Um, and he also got to coach um, the California Collegiate Summer League from 2017 to 2019. Um, he was a 2017 assistant coach. He got to coach the all-star team. Um, at uh, 2018, another assistant coach job, also got to coach the all-star team. And then in 2019, he got to be the head coach of the California Pilots. So that sounds like a lot. It's even more when you consider the fact that Shane is our age. Shane is only are you 24 or 23, Shane? I uh, just turned 24, so. Oh, happy late birthday. Ooh. Oh, thank you. Thank you. So, yeah. yeah you're, you know. you're, reading, you're reading through that, and it sounds like I'm a better assistant coach than a varsity coach. But, <laughs> you know, I, I uh, apparently have some work to do on my own head coaching resume. <laughs> hey, but you know what? Like, how many, how many coaches get to start as, you know, head coach? I mean, I think it's a better process to start as an assistant and move your way up. But, mm -hmm. yeah, that's a lot of stuff for – a 24 year old. Yeah. So um, I am so thrilled to have Shane on here. Um, you know, when we were first starting thinking of, you know, guests that we could have on this show, Shane was one of the first ones that popped in my mind. And one of the big reasons for that is I follow Shane on every social media possible. And he is so passionate about his program. Like you can't follow him and not get pumped up to coach or, start a season or make your program better from the graphics to the workouts, everything. It's just, it's awesome. And, um, it's, it's something, if you don't follow it, I recommend you do, it'll get you more pumped up to be a baseball coach. Um, and another reason I wanted to have Shane on was, and this is what we're going to start with is your interview at CVC. Um, I heard that you were the most prepared, uh, interviewee that people had ever seen so you want to tell me about that a little bit uh, I don't know necessarily if ever but uh no I came into it feeling really prepared um you know first off I was really blessed with my situation uh at Fowler High School um you know getting to be there um, working under head coach Bill Fever um who's I think going into his 23rd 24th year as the head of that program um I worked in the classroom with him all day with a part-time job um so I was super blessed to get to have someone to bounce ideas off of um, as I was building that. And then, uh, you know, it was always a goal of mine to be a head coach. Um, I always wanted to have my own program. Um, specifically, I always wanted to come back to CVC and, uh, you know, take this program where I felt like it could go. Um, and so, you know, during my time in Fowler um, and then with my summer league and, and the various things I did, um, I just really saw them as opportunities for me to develop my own um, resume my own bit of experience and then just keep track of it all. Um, and so, you know, as, as I was doing, it was just putting it all into a packet um, at the suggestion of coach fever, but uh, you know, building this portfolio that um, really brought me into this interview, uh, feeling really prepared and feeling ready um, to, to hit the ground running. Um, you know, it was really important. I thought as an assistant coach, not to just be going through the motions as an assistant coach, um, but to be taking it as an opportunity to develop. Um, despite your ambitions, um, you know, being alongside of him as he scheduled tournaments, as he scheduled practices, as he scheduled a season, um, 
I was essentially able to take exactly what he did and put it in my portfolio and say, Hey, I know how to do this. Um, you know, and, and, and not be lying about that either, but feeling really able to say, Hey, you know, I know how to inventory all the jerseys at the end of the season. And I already have a system in place because, um, you know, he told me something really funny when I interviewed for the job, he said, when you're an assistant coach, it's 90% sport, 10% administrative. And when you're a head coach, it flips, it's 90% administrative and it's 10% sport. And uh, there's, a, there's a big reality to that. Fortunately, that 10% is incredibly fulfilling. Um, you know, it's incredibly fulfilling to be the, the head of the program. Um, but there is a lot more administrative stuff. And, you know, in the interview, I went into it, you know, with this idea that that's what they were looking for. They weren't looking for just, do you know, you know, how to run a bunt defense? And they weren't looking for, you know, do you know how to teach swing? They're looking for someone that can, that can steer their ship and that can do the things that Frankly, your administration, you know, your administration doesn't want to do. Your athletic director doesn't want to do all that. So um, I was really lucky to to come into the interview prepared, knowing what they were looking for with a with a nice binder that I have framed somewhere in my house. I, I heard I, I heard about that binder. That 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 is that is what I specifically heard about was that you had this amazing binder with you know preseason workouts, in season workouts, postseason nutrition, everything. And I just think that's uh, awesome. I'll have to shoot a copy of it over to you and you can I would love to read it. I want a little bit. We'll we'll just redact a couple a couple specifics, but uh. <laughs> <laughs> But you know, you you just said something about um you know, something that, you know, athletic directors might want to do or administration doesn't want to do. I feel like that one thing I've learned especially from talking to athletic directors about this is that's the sign of a good program head is the athletic director doesn't have to worry about you, right? You know, He's not going to have, you know, you coming up all the time like, oh, our program's out of money or we're out of this or we need that. Like you do a good job running your fundraising. You do a good job handling your parents. You do a good job handling your kids. I feel like that's a really good sign of a good head coach. Right. And um, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I, I joke sometimes I feel like my athletic director might be tired of me because I bug him a little too much about the next thing that we're going to be doing. But uh, no, that, that, that's not what they want to deal with. They have too much going on their own, you know, at their own time. So they don't need to be doing your job um, simultaneously, you know. So I, I feel like, you know, part of our role is to, you know, make life easier, make, make that, smith, that ship go smoother, um, you know, and just, just knock out the stuff that you got to do with the vision going forward. And I, I think also something you said that I think is super important for young coaches to hear is you went from being an assistant coach to a head coach. And that's how a lot, that's the process that a lot of people go through is you have to be an assistant coach for a little bit before you have your own team. Mm-hmm. But that is a reality check that it's not just coming up with lineups when you're a varsity head coach, you got to worry about the whole program. You got to worry about scheduling. You got to worry about what tournaments you're going to play in. Right. So that's something that I think young coaches that are starting to transition, I think that's really important, a really important reality check to hear. And also, um, you're at your, um, your um, alma mater for uh, high school coaching. Eric and I are doing the same thing. We're, at mm-hmm. this, we're coaching at the school that we um, attended and played at. And on top of that, we, ha- we have the passion, like we have so much passion for our program and our school because we played there. We want to see it do well, just like you said. But we also are young, just like you. And sometimes, you know, one of the first things you have to do is kind of take control of your program. Would you agree with that, Erica? Yeah, for sure. I feel like, well, I guess hearing you talk about everything that you're saying, and I understand that you came from this school. So like Luke said, we just have a lot of pride, like coming from where we came Mm -hmm. from. Um, and you want to take care of it. And I'm sure when you were there, you're probably like, dang, I can't wait to come back and coach one day. And like, that's how I felt. And, um, you know, going back and forth from your first school to here, um, as a young coach who is very new to this program now, how did you gain control and even establish it to be your program now? Yeah. Um, and that, you know, that point you make, you know, especially tying in the youth, Um, You know, it's probably the most important thing to acknowledge first off from the beginning is acknowledging that you are young, Um, regardless if you're an assistant coach or a head coach, um, walking in and just acting like you have control of the whole deal 
um, would be pretty foolish um, because, you know, people are going to see right through it, especially when you're dealing with high school age kids. They're, they're not idiots. They're darn near adults. Um, a lot of them are bigger than me and can beat me in a fight or smarter than me or whatever. So, um, <laughs> you know, whatever it is. So, um, you know, they're adults, they're people and they could see right through it. So, um, you know, being open and honest is kind of the first step, I think, towards, um, you know, gaining that control. I remember, you know, the first thing that I did when I when came in is I said, okay, we got to have a parent meeting. Um, you know, I got to meet the parents. I know that the previous coach before me um, had a lot of tension with the parents. So, um, you know, if you want control, got to have the parents on your side. Um, and so sat down with the parents and I remember going through my head and I was saying, starting to say along the lines of like, I understand um, how difficult it would be for you to want everything to, for your child you want your child to have the whole world and then them not have it. You know, you want your child to be the best player or whatever. And I stopped myself in the middle of the sentence because I don't know. I don't have kids. I'm 24 years old. Um, and I thought that the moment that I said that, I saw some heads perk up in the room. Like, oh, he actually acknowledges this. Like, he's not trying to fake his way through this. Um, and so, you know, just moments like that of genuine honesty um, does a lot to get people on your side. Um, you know, I, th there's no way that you can over communicate. I really don't believe that um, conflict, uh, you know, conflict is strongly rooted in a lack of communication. And so to communicate with your parents, to communicate with your players, it's going to keep everyone on the same page. Um, and then after that, it's just, you know, understanding that mistakes are going to happen uh, and that it's okay. You know, as a young coach, be it, you know, me as a head coach, be it if you're an assistant coach, um, whoever put you in that position, put you in that position for a reason. They put you in that position knowing that you're going to make mistakes, that you're going to learn on the fly. Um, sometimes it stinks for me because sometimes my mistakes in the middle of a game that matters on, you know, varsity baseball field with playoff implications. Um, but, you know, my admin selected me to lead this ship knowing that, knowing that that mistake might happen. And so, um, you know, just really building those relationships, really having, you know, uh, open paths of communication with, with parents, with students, and with admin all around. Um, and just, you know, understanding that the process you're going through is a process together. Um, you know, you're, you're merely one piece of the ship. Um, you might be the guy that has the hands on the wheel of the ship, but man, you need that whole crew to, you need that whole crew working. Um, and so, you know, you can't, feel like you have to be so in control like you have to hold it so tight because it's not going to work that way it's not going to work that way you have to let people have their uh input that they have and then just guide the ship where you see it going yeah totally. and and you know being transparent with parents i think is huge and that's something that i've learned because no matter how good of a coach you are no matter how great you feel like you're doing doesn't matter if you're coaching boys girls doesn't matter what sport you will have a parent come up and ask you about something later on in the season about playtime. Even if the kid's getting playtime, hey, how come my kid's playing right field? He's been a shortstop his whole life, you know, stuff like that. And those early conversations where you're really transparent, being able to fall back on that, you know, I told everybody in the beginning of the season, you know, I would like to get everybody in. Um, but when it comes down to this, I will put my best lineup in, stuff like that. That way it's not, hey, in the beginning of the season, you never said anything about playtime, so we assume we were all getting the same amount of playtime. It's really good to fall back on that stuff because if you have to recreate a conversation instead of saying something that they've mm -hmm. already heard, and as a young coach, those situations are awkward. Yeah. I'm like, <laughs> like I, I don't want to say anything wrong. I don't, you know, it's super uncomfortable, and they get better as you go, but – um, there's there's nothing wrong with being honest with a parent um you know there's a way to go about it but i think you know we get scared because we don't want to hurt a parent's feelings mm -hmm. it's real it's really hard to tell johnny's mom that johnny's not that good you yeah. know um and that's okay johnny might get better johnny might work really hard but mm -hmm. you know it needs to be communicated to the parent why they're why they're getting what they're getting and in all honesty if you keep telling the parent you know, the fallback answer. Oh yeah. If Johnny keeps working really hard. Johnny's going to get in there. Well, Johnny might work harder than everyone all season long. Johnny still might not be as good as anyone else. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You're still going to try to get the kid all the time you can, but you know, this, this is, this is competitive high school sports now that we're talking about. Um, and so the moment, you know, if, if the parents let on all season, okay, if Johnny stays after practice and Johnny does this and Johnny does that, 
sorry to any Johnnies out there, but uh, you know, if, if Johnny <laughs> keeps doing this and that, that Johnny's going to get playing time and then it gets to May and it's the end of the season and he still hasn't really gotten the same playing time as everyone else. They're going to say, what the heck you lied to us. So, um, you know, it's just being transparent, being honest, finding the right way to go about it. But you know, that transparent honesty mm-hmm. is going to, it's going to pay off because A, you're going to have the parents on your side and B, as a coach, you're going to avoid more of those conversations that you really don't want to have at the end of the season when you're making the playoff push of, well, you know, angry parent yelling at you because you promised something that you couldn't deliver on. Mm-hmm. And that's, you know, playtime. I know we're kind of harping on playtime a little bit here, but it's very easy to tell people, and this is big for young coaches, don't make promises about playtime that you can't fulfill because it's very easy to say yeah you know I'm gonna at least play everybody three innings in and at bat well when you're in the middle of a game that's, <laughs> it's really intense and sorry to the Johnny's like Shane just said <laughs> if if Johnny's O for his last 35 at bats <laughs> you might not want Johnny batting in the last inning and this, the coach is also trying to win games so well, that's that's a tough you know the tough reality is that um, you know, we're, we're in a vocation right here where we are judged on two things. You know, we're judged on a, you know, the meaning of sport, you know, producing quality young men and women to go out into the, into the world and be better people, but we're also graded on wins and losses. Um, and, and that's an unfortunate thing um, because we, we don't want to make it all about winning, but if we go three and 23 every year, no kids are going to play baseball anymore. We're not going to have a baseball program. So we have to win games. Kids don't want to lose. You know, they don't want to go get their teeth pounded in by the team, by the school down the street. They want to win games. So we, we have to find a way to do both. Um, you know, and, and then the you know, second thing, our job as a coach is with every player is to put our players in a position to have success. Yeah. Um, and so if, if Johnny's, you know, Johnny struggles to hit and the other team's got a guy on there that's throwing 88 miles per hour as a senior in high school, Johnny's not touching that ball. He's not going to have fun doing that anymore. So I got to find a position that's the same way in volleyball. I'm sure that, you know, you, you got to put someone in, in a position that they're going to have success and that success might not roll around all that often. Um, when it does, I'll get you in, but you just have to trust that I'm not going to put you in a position where you're going to be miserable. Yeah. Because I mean, kids got to fail and learn, but at the same time, if it is just, you know, strike out, strike out, strike out, you know, 35 times in a row, they're probably not going to want to play anymore. They're not, they're not going to have any confidence. They're not going to believe. And that's just a slippery slope to go down, but yeah, really good stuff. Um, obviously the culture was a, a big thing for you, but what else um, really helps the program grow? Cause I know you mentioned, I have it right here that uh, CVC hadn't made the playoffs um, in division four since 2011. And, you know, you guys are obviously improving. So, like, what are some things that you put in to help improve the program? Um, you know, it's it just – it's first that buy-in is the biggest step. Um, you know, getting the kids to, to want to make the change, um, making them feel in control uh, of what they're doing. Um, and then it just comes down to work. Um, you know, implementing off-season programs. Um, you know, our, our first year – or this past year um, before, obviously before shutdown, but we did summer ball for the first time in the history of CVC. Um, You know, when I was at Fowler, we played 20 games in the summer. We managed to play, I believe like 10 last summer. So big improvement. We get, you know, every kid gets more at bat. Same thing in the fall. We played fall ball for the first time ever doing fall workouts, winter workouts, Um, just getting more work in so that the kids are more um, ready for what they see. If you're trying to figure it out in the moment that it's happening, uh, you know, you're too late. So, you know, adding in those extra reps and then, you know, just creating an environment um, where they have enthusiasm about coming to work every day throughout the year, um, where they want to win for each other, where they want to win for the program, where they want to leave some sort of legacy behind them. Um, because, you know, obviously the three of us feel that way um, really strongly, given the fact that we're all three back at our alma maters um, coaching. And I think that a lot more kids would buy into uh, that same uh, sort of pride in where they come from if they're given a positive experience. So, um, you know, build those. Re- I'm, I'm a big believer that positive experiences come from positive relationships. Um, and so, you know, that's kind of one of my key things is trying to have a personal relationship with every kid on the team. 
um, every kid in our program, really. And that's really hard because you get a lot of them um, and some of them are into different things. Um, you know, we fall into a trap a lot of times, I think, in coaching that we only want to have a relationship with like the best player on the team because the best player on the team likes the sport probably as much as you do. Um, you know, the best player in the team is the one that shows up and works as hard as you did when you were in school and, and understands it the way that you do. Um, but that kid's really not the one that's going to make the difference, to be honest. And that, that's mm -hmm. kind of an interesting revelation to get to. But every team has a couple of those kids. Um, but it's the kids at the bottom of the, you know, that are further at the bottom of the lineup. It's the kids that are on the bench coming into role spots, things like that, that are going to make your difference. Are they engaged uh, throughout the game where they could come in and succeed? Or are they kick back, not caring? Are they kick back, not caring and becoming a cancer to your team uh, as the game's going on? Are they killing the, the mood in there? Are they being energized and helping your, um, you know, everyone else stay up? during practice, are they competing or are they not? Um, and you know, a lot of that comes through having that relationship where A, the kid wants to go out and compete for you and go out and compete for his program and for his buddy, but B, where you can, you know, have that tough conversation with the kid of, hey, turn it on, <laughs> you know? Um, you know, and where they trust you enough to say, hey, if you turn it on and this happens, you know, we can have success. Um, but if they don't trust you and they don't have that relationship with you, then you're just spinning the tires. Um, and I think, that it's really those kids in the depth of your program that are going to be the difference makers to helping you, you jump over the step. You know, there, there hasn't been a team that I haven't, that I've been a part of that hasn't had two or three kids at the top of the program that, that have been your dudes, but I've been a part of teams that haven't had the kids at the bottom. And those have been the teams that have struggled. Yeah. And, and, you know, you just, the whole thing about, you know, killing the mood or something. Um, I'm going to kind of hand this to Chapa a little bit. Um, I helped her with her, um, freshman girls this last year for volleyball and I'm not going to use any names of the girls or anything without their permissions but there was a girl that you'll know exactly who I'm talking about <laughs> just wasn't the biggest didn't jump the highest um, she would go in and just have such a burst of energy such a shot in the arm that even if she didn't touch the ball we would go on like a 5-1 run right yeah like yeah it, it was just an instant burst of energy that kind of like you're kind of describing what an X factor is on a team mm -hmm. and you know in a in a like a sport like volleyball where we got to get to a certain score you know a 6-0 run makes a pretty big difference right yeah or you know in your case in baseball you're the you know whoever's batting seventh comes up and just gives you a good shot in the arm drives in a run or something that's a big difference in a game like and there's always room for that. But sorry, Chop, I was going to hand you off to that to kind of talk about that impact. Oh, well, I mean, I feel like you nailed it. I don't know. I mean, I know baseball, but as comparing to volleyball, it kind of doesn't compare. But I, I kind of, I don't know, I guess I am curious if that's like the same in baseball in a way, because like the player he's talking about, like, right, she can come in. She probably didn't touch the ball. She didn't, she didn't come in to serve, that's for sure. But having her off the court was, like, somehow a liability. Like, it's just better mm -hmm. to have her out there. Does that apply to baseball? Or, like, do you find that it applies? Yeah. Um, you know, I, in, in baseball, you know, I'm, the reality of baseball is, you know, there's no clock and there's no score limit or anything like that. So that, that's always one of the interesting things. And there's, a, you know, there's many ways you can succeed in baseball. Um, you know, I, I've had kids in my lineup before that haven't gotten a hit all year, but they're the best in the program at hitting the ball on the ground and making the mess up or the best in the program at walking. Um, and there's a million ways to succeed. Mm -hmm. um, even more important though, I think, you know, I, I had two kids or three kids this past season that were ineligible um, Till the midway point because they transferred to us in the middle of the year um and so you know cif says they can't play for 50 percent of the year or whatever um you know those kids were responsible for two of our biggest wins of the year we went on the road and we beat the number one school in our division um you know took a two-hour bus ride and, and went and won on the road um you know and I, I credit these kids largely for it just because regardless if they could get in the game or not just the energy and enthusiasm that they had being a part of that team and you know what you know our best guy strikes out looking with the bases loaded it's really easy to come in and be upset for a while it's yeah. really easy to have your head down all of a sudden your best guy is not your best guy anymore because he's not in the right headspace whereas you got guys you know those people that are lower in your lineup or lower on your bench that have that enthusiasm in life 
hey, you got the next one, you know, and, and they get that, you know, that spark back on the team, even without touching the, the touching the field, um, you know, or vice versa. That guy strikes out with the bases loaded and he rolls into the dugout and the whole team's just shoulders down and moping around. Man, the whole world's over. You're, you're out of that game now because, you know, just the vibe in that aspect of it. So, um, you know, I, I think, you know, having people understand that you don't necessarily even have to be the person in the moment to make an impact um, can go can go a long way. Yeah, and I mean, like, this just kind of popped in my head, Choppa, is like, how many times a game do we yell at the girls to call in and out if they're not in the game? Totally, right? yeah, like, totally. Like, if- Well, in volleyball, the sidelines, mm-hmm. like in volleyball, the sidelines matters. Mm-hmm. Like, you don't want to worry about tracing the ball to the back line. So if you can have the eyes on the bench do it for you, that's cool. Yeah, yeah just, absolutely. Yeah, yeah that kind of communication is huge. Um, the next thing I kind of want to ask you about, um, so you were at Fowler. Um, you had a lot of success at Fowler. Um, and then you went back to CVC where you played before, like we mentioned. Um, mm-hmm. how, how was the private school setting um, different compared to the public school setting you had at Fowler? Um, you know, it's, it's, really, it's really cool to get to deal with both. Um, you know, it, it was interesting, too, because as there, especially during my first year, I was doing my student teaching at a school down the street, too, so a, a public school. So I was kind of getting to see them uh, simultaneously at the same time. Um, but it's important to remember at, at the end of the day, um, you know, a high school student is still a high school student. Um, you, know, a, you know, an athlete is still an athlete. A kid is still a kid. Um, and so they still want the same things. They still want to be cool. They still want, you know, the boys still want the girls to chase after them and the, the girls still want the boys to chase after them and, and the parents still want the best in the world for their kids. And, um, you know, at the end of the day, it's all the same. Um, you know, I feel like the difference really comes from where you understand that your kids are coming from and what experiences they can relate to. Um, because at the end of the day, every kid is, is coached in a different way. You can't coach every kid the same way. Um, you know, there's some kids on your, in your program that you can yell and scream at all day and they're just going to say, yes, coach, and go do what you wanted to do. And there's other kids that if you yell and scream, they're going to fall over on the field and, and start crying. So, um, you know, you have to know your, like the, the, you have to have your, a pulse for your program and pulse for the individual students or uh, athletes and, and know what you're dealing with. Um, you know, one thing, luckily at a private school, we have a lot of kids that come from, um, you know, fortunate backgrounds you know we have a lot of dairy kids a lot of ag kids at our school um but at the same time we have a lot of parents at our school that have made a huge sacrifice just to send their kids to be a part of us you know we I've had kids in our program that you know their parent we decided my first year to do a a banquet at a expensive venue and some parents emailed in saying hey we can't afford this venue you know because they were making such a sacrifice um to Mm -hmm. to be a part of the school and a part of the program so um you know understanding just everyone's different um in that aspect another interesting thing just kind of with the private school is um you know i I think we're a little more prone to parents wanting to be involved um actively um you know in some regard i I never think that an idea of a coach of, of of disregarding parent involvement is a good idea but I think when they're paying, you know, for their child's education, they earn a little bit of a right to be a little bit more involved, at least to ask a couple more questions um, and be to make you a little more accessible. So, you know, it makes me really have to consider every time that I don't want to even respond to a simple email from a parent, you know, or something like that. Um, You know, they're, they're paying money for their kid to be a part of this. So they deserve those types of responses and it doesn't have to be the response that they want. I could still be honest in my own way. Um, and I could still be considerate, but, um, you know, just understanding that, um, you know, they have a little bit of a, uh, a warranted, um, involvement and then just, you know, understanding where, where our kids come from, um, you know, and, and, and the backgrounds and experiences that they have that can, that can help you get your finger on their pulse. Yeah, definitely. I think that's a big, um, misconception from a lot of people is, you know, you see a private school, like you coach a private school team, people will look at you guys and say, Oh, it's a bunch of rich kids. Like, like you said, there's families that are really sacrificing and kind of like 
putting it together a little bit to try to put their kids there because they think that's the best situation for their kid. Like, and you know, you do have the other end of the spectrum where you do have kids that come from really fortunate backgrounds, but it's important to consider that they're all not the same kid. They all don't have the same mm-hmm. experiences. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, CVC, this kind of goes back to, um, we're kind of piggybacking off of, you know, each kid's different. I know you have a lot of multi-sport athletes because I see that you attend a lot of their games from football, mm-hmm. basketball. Um, how does, um, how does being a multi-sport athlete help them? You know, we're really fortunate at CVC to, um, I, I'm really fortunate that our other two main, you know, our, our football coach and our basketball coach do such a good job. Um, we, you know, our football coach has been here, um, since before I came here. Um, and, uh, you know, it's really cool now kind of working alongside of him because he was my teacher, my football coach in high school. Um, so it's cool to get on a first name basis. You get that fun little, okay. fun little bit when you graduate up. Right. But, uh, you know, they, he's put together a really tight program that, you know, competes year after year. Um, and ultimately at the end of the day, the, the best thing that comes from that is the kids learn how to compete. Um, you know, there, there's the benefits that you, we could get all into the theories and sciences of the benefits of playing multiple sports. And, um, you know, there's tons of benefits to that, you know, on top of toughness and everything else, the athletic movements that you develop by playing football or basketball or soccer or whatever it might be. Um, at the end of the day, they, he teaches them to compete. And it's really good, I think, for them to learn how to compete in another setting um, and get, you know, get hungry for winning in another setting and and come back to our program and demand the same of themselves here. Um, You know, my first year where we had that large improvement um, from the year before, before I got here, our football team was state runner up, you know, they, they won section championship. They won the regional championship and they were state runner up. They showed up here like, Hey, we win. We, we, you know, we're ready to win. That that's what we do. And uh, that, that was, I think that's something we miss a lot when we're, when we're coaching. Um, I think, you know, we, we worry a lot about teaching the, the technical form of our sport. Um, and I, I don't know how this applies to volleyball, but for baseball, for example, you know, we worry a lot about teaching swing and we learn a lot about pitching, you know, pitching mechanics, we totally. learn a lot about throwing hard. But at the end of the day, if you don't compete, if you don't win, if you don't go out there and beat the guy, you know, I don't care if you throw 90 miles per hour, or you throw 65, go up there and compete and beat the guy, you're going to be playing for us. Um, and that was kind of my, you know, what I'm really lucky with, with our other sport athletes is they get more opportunities to go figure out how to win, how to compete and have that competitive, you know, spirit, competitive heart. Um, so when they come to us, they're, you know, they're expecting the same of themselves here. You know, that's, that's just where it's so important. I think as a coach, especially when you're in a high school environment, um, to be supportive of your other sports on campus because they're doing just as much for you um, as, as, as you know, you're even doing for yourself just if they're doing things the right way. Yeah, that is so interesting because, you know, everyone wants to talk about, and it's all very valid, the, um, you know, the biomechanics of it and the injuries, overuse stuff like that. That's very valid, but, you know, you just hit on a lot of, you know, developing like a winning brain almost, right? Like, we see this in volleyball. I'm sure you have it in baseball, football, everything. There's certain times you just have to do what you got to do to get a win. And, yeah. you know, if you just play volleyball, right. And you're just like, Oh, well I do this and it's not working. So I don't know what to do. But if you play other sports, sometimes you got to figure it out. Like, man, like this guy's kicking my butt. I got to do this. It just makes you a little mentally stronger. And, um, Erica, I don't know if you have anything to say about that in terms of, you know, you have girls that play multi-sports as well. Um, Do you notice any differences? Well, like Shane said, I think the whole part is like going somewhere else and figuring out how to win there because, I mean, I remember back when I was in school, some coaches, I mean, some coaches don't support multiple, like multiple sports. Like they want you to focus on their sport so you can help them win and whatever. But I find like what Shane said is like, oh my gosh, so valuable because it's important for a coach to support that and to tell you like, yeah, go play. And they're going to, like it, it really just develops you like in so many more ways. But one thing that stood out to me was when you said, um, you know, you played for your football coach and then you got to graduate and come back and like, now you're on a first name basis. And 
now you had your whole program to yourself, which is awesome. But um, going into your first year, did you have any like first year expectations that were like big or small and have they changed at all for next year? Yeah, certainly. Um, you know, first year, you know, again, I said earlier, you know, kind of the two things I think we're graded on in our, in our vocation is, uh, you know, the quality of kids we produce and then uh, win, wins and losses, um, you know, and so the, the tangible goal was the wins and losses. Um, they had won three, three games the year before, um, you know, and th those three wins were against teams that weren't very strong. Um, so being realistic about that, um, you know, I came in wanting to get double digit wins. I, you know, I thought if we go from three, uh, three wins to 10, I thought that that would be, you know, a, a huge step in the right direction. Um, you know, really blessed that we exceeded that and managed to finish the year 500. Once we hit that 10 win mark, you know, we sat down as a team and said, okay, well, what's next? And, um, you know, our goal was to get a home playoff game at that point then, um, which we figured we could do with a 500 record. Unfortunately, we got sent on the road um, in a 7-8 matchup. But uh, or an eight eight nine matchup, so just barely missed it. But uh, so you know the the tangible win loss um, was kind of the first goal. Um, then my second goal was to you know have kids come back to our program. Totally. Um, and so that that was something that was really um, you know special. And I kind of kept that a little deeper down in myself. I didn't really share that as the program vision because I didn't want anyone to feel like they had to. Um, but you know I remember you know you know, myself coming back um, and the experience that I had, and I'm really lucky, uh, you know, two of my assistant coaches um, I played with at the same time and they came back and I wanted kids to have the same passion for the program that um, we left with. And so, um, you know, come back either as a coach or come back just as a supporter. Um, but, you know, really lucky um, this past year, actually, our, our starting shortstop from my first year coaching joined our staff right away when he was attending junior college and came on as one of our assistant coaches. Um, so that was really cool to, to turn around and have uh, my first player that I coached come on as a coach as well. Um, really special to have and uh, see him grow with our players. Um, you know, he's kind of taken a big brother role to a lot of them because he played with a lot of them. So that's cool. Um, and then, you know, just as, as the goals change, you know, just continuing to set sights higher. Um, you know, I'm a, I'm a big believer in having, you know, attainable goals. Um, I think, and goals that we could be in control of. Um, I think it would be really foolish to go out and say, hey, we're going to go win all of our games this year. It's not obtainable, and we're not really in control of that, especially in a sport like baseball. Um, you know, a lot of stuff can go your against you in baseball that you have no control. Um, you know, bad strike calls, bad out calls, whatever it is, it just might not be your day. Baseball is a game of failure. Um, but to have obtainable goals, one of our big ones right now, uh, we want to go, we're a division four school. I want to go play a division one school this year and I want to go beat them, I, you know, or at least go compete against them. So, um, you know, finding a spot on our schedule to put a division one school, um, A, that's willing to play us, um, but B, that, you know, we can go compete against and, uh, you know, you know, establish ourselves that way. Um, another goal of ours is to be, you know, competing for a league championship. Um, and then also, um, you know, just, just, being down the stretch in the playoffs, I think we still want to host a playoff game. Um, I think that these are all really obtainable things that we can do um, that we're in control of the outcome of rather than just saying purely, you know, we want to win X amount of games or we want to win a championship. Everyone wants to win a championship. That's not a real goal. Everyone wants to win a championship. Um, you know, you could ask any, any high school coach in the entire state, they're going to say they're going to win a championship. But, uh, you know, setting the site that the process to get there um, I think that those sort of things would be things that would uh, help us get on that path. And then if it happens, great. And if it doesn't, then, you know, we turn around the next year and we reevaluate and set new goals. Yeah, I, I, I just had to laugh at myself a little bit. I was just telling Erica about this recently. Yeah. Um, you know, my first in college, I mean, you know this, Shane, um, I coached with Casey at Fireball and Casey will be on mm. here eventually to talk about, you know, her philosophies and what it's like coaching at a small school. Um, you know, we, we, we kind of did that where we set super high expectations and the girls, the girls did it too. And I remember our um, little preseason meeting where the girls did their, Casey did such a great job of organizing that meeting and how we're going to come up with our goals and, you know, pick captains. It was like something that I want, I bet I will always use. She's amazing at that. And 
you know, the girls were saying they want to ring. We want to do this. We want to, and then me being young and I love winning. I'm like, yeah, like, let's go. Mm. And then, and then, you know, got off to a little rough start and now those goals don't look as attainable. So the, the whole mood kind of went down and I, I learned so much from that of like, okay, stop placing these super high expectations year one. Like, let's think about, you know, like you said, going 500, let's think about getting a home playoff game. And I don't know if that's a young coach thing. I think it is. I think it's a young coach thing of coming in and being super unrealistic. I know that I was guilty of it. Casey was much more realistic with it than me. She'd be like, oh, well, you know, let's win league first, you know, stuff like that. But yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's really easy because we come into this and I, I was a victim of it too. Luckily I didn't have a lot of control over the situation when I started coaching, um, you know, when I was an assistant coach, but it's really easy to sit there and think, you know, man, I have all the answers. And if we do all the, all the things that I think will work, I think we'll win. Um, but then we realize really quickly that it's very idealistic. Um, and you know, how foolish too, I mean, for, for us, for baseball, our section championship, it's a one, seven inning game. So, I mean, man, you go out there and you're someone gets hurt or, or what, like your season's a bust because that one day didn't go your way. You know, you can't, you can't judge your success on that. Mm -hmm. um, so then, you know, I, I think it's much more responsible than uh, let's set our goals at obtainable things that put us in a position. And then if that day goes our way, Hey, great. We get to dog pile on the mound and celebrate and get new pretty jewelry that we get to wear once a year at a banquet. And uh, you know, if it doesn't, then, Hey, well, we still achieved a lot as a group and we still have something that we can look back and be proud of. Yeah. And I mean, you went from winning a, winning a ring at Fowler and winning a sex and championship to CVC. And, you know, it, like you said, it'd be kind of um, foolish to say, Oh, well, we're going to win a Valley championship this year. You know, your first year. Yeah. Coming. And, and, but I mean, you looked at it, look at your improvements. You guys got up to a 500 record. You got, you got to go to the playoffs. Like when you take a step back and look at it, it's like, okay, this program's going in the right direction. Instead of sitting, it, it, instead of sitting back and going, Oh, we didn't win a title. It's funny going back even to my time at Fowler because, you know, I was there for two seasons. Um, and I, I think that the mark of a really elite team um, in high school baseball, at least in our section, we, we get 28 games a year. So I think the mark of an elite team is, is winning 20 games. So you go 20 and eight, um, you know, that's, that's a really tough mark in baseball. Um, they, my first year there, we won 20 games before playoffs even started. And we wind up getting knocked out the first round of playoffs. Second year, um, you know, we lost a bit more. Um, we end up making it through the playoffs. We kind of claw through each game, claw through each game, and, and you know, we end up in the championship game, champion, championship game somehow. Um, and, you know, there's a call for, a controversial call from the umpire with the leadoff batter. He puts us on second base. The next guy makes an error. All of a sudden, we're up one nothing in the championship game. Um, and we never look back, but lo and behold, that game wound up being our 20th win of the season. So which year is more mm -hmm. successful? Is, is it the game that we were, you know, learning and losing and, you know, grinding and hitting these smaller goals to put ourselves in a position for the umpire to essentially put us on second base and rattle the pitcher and whatever it does. And we end up with a ring or is it the season that sure we won 20 games and we set a win mark, but now we're out in the first round of playoffs. Yeah. You know, um, so it's yeah. just, you know, fixating our sights on, on, you know, which one defines success. Um, and to me, you know, I think the small milestones are, are the best way to get there. Yeah. And now, so I, I feel like you've been hinting at it and giving little parts of this throughout. Yeah. But one question that I've always wanted to ask you, and this is, I think this is the best situation to ask you is I want to know what row the boat means. All right. So, um, yeah, I do. I do implement it a lot still in my uh, talking. However, um, you know, kind of moved off of it a little bit. But uh, row the boat I stole from University of Minnesota football head coach PJ Fleck. Um, he started it when he was at Western Michigan. It was kind of his mantra. Um, he does Google row the boat on YouTube. There's a ton of great videos on it where he talks about um, you know losing a child and the way that he developed this mantra. And it's really great, um, inspired me. And so when I came into CVC, I decided that, you know, we needed something to get behind. And, you know, I, I think that 
Um, I'm not super smart. I'm better off stealing stuff from someone else and, and pretending like it's mine. So I grabbed that myself. Um, the, the essence of it is um, that there's three parts to a boat. There's, uh, you know, there's the boat itself, which is your support system. Um, there's the oar, which is the energy you bring um, to move the boat. And then there's the compass, which is your direction that you're headed. So basically, in order to have a successful program, successful life, um, you have to have an oar, you have to have energy, you have to have some sort of support system to lean back on, and you have to have some sort of idea where you're headed. If, you're, if you don't have either of those, you're either floating in the water, you're not paddling anywhere, or you're heading off to some island that you don't know where it exists. Um, and then coming into CBC, um, I grabbed that and then I added in, you know, did, did the Christian school thing and added in a Bible verse about water so that way it fit in with what we were doing. Um, I was really excited about it. I wanted to implement as much as we could. Um, but what I found really quickly is that it's really hard to get people behind something that's not your own. Um, and so, you know, most of the, the enthusiasm I had about it kind of seemed fake. It kind of seemed forced on um, the kids weren't grabbing on it as quite as hard as I wanted to. Um, and so, you know, at the end of the year, I kind of sat back and looked like, okay, I need to figure out, I still want an idea of what resembles our program, um, something for us to get behind. And my mind kind of throughout the year kept going back to, I actually did an interview when I was hired with our local newspaper. Um, and in it, I used this word doer that I wanted our kids to become doers, um, doers in baseball and doers in life. And then uh, a couple months later, um, they did an interview with one of our pitchers. Um, we did a cool breast cancer awareness game, um, raised a bunch of money. Um, and they interviewed him because he had a good day. And he used the same phrase. He mentioned being a doer. And so I was like, okay, maybe this is something that people are grasping. Same time I was listening to, um, if, if anyone involved in coaching, um, you know, everyone that's listening to this probably wants to be educated, even uh, students. Um, great to listen to. There's a mental performance coach named Brian Kane. He does a lot of um, college baseball, professional baseball, and then he does some other sports, golf, UFC, but um, he does a lot of really great stuff. And he, I was listening to an interview that he was doing with the TCU head coach, and he talked about what do you, if you were to ask your players what a person from your program embodies, what would they say it is? Would they all have the same answer? Um, and so Coach uh, Schlaznigal at TCU was like, I'm I don't know, let's, let's go see. So they took their whole program and they had them all write down what does a TCU baseball player look like? And he said they had about 40 different answers. <laughs> and so um, with that in mind, and then they were able to narrow it down to like one sentence. So with that in mind, I sat down, I said, okay, well, what do I want our four, um, you know, what do I want our players to embody? What do I want our program to embody? And we broke down off of that word doer. Um, you know, we broke down, I want our players to be detailed. We want our players to be objective about the things that they do, the way they see themselves and the goals they have. We want them to be energized and we want them to be responsive. Um, you know, not, react, uh, not reactive, but responsive. And uh, so we really jumped all in this past year with the doer thing, um, did a cool deal with, um, you know, players earning shirts that say doer on it to wear on game day. Um, older guys nominated younger guys to nom uh, nominate them as doers. We got doer stickers on our batting helmets for whenever someone was being a doer. Um, and it's really become kind of our thing. Um, you know, and the lesson of that being um, is that I took from it all is, you know, it's okay to borrow stuff from other coaches, but also make it your own because mm -hmm. it's been way easier for me. It's been way easier for a program to get behind something that's organic and that's ours. And obviously we did not invent the word doer. It's on every Chevy or uh, Chevron, you know, billboard in the Central Valley, at least around here. Um, but to, to spin it in a way that's ours, in a way that's us, and now to hear it said around our facility, you know, during practice, a kid lays out during batting practice, he doesn't have to do that. He's just be energized. And someone yells, that's a doer. Man, that fires me up. And that's, that's exciting. And that means that the kids are starting to understand, you know, in a smaller scope, what we want to be about. Um, and, and once they understand what we want to be about, it's going to help, um, you know, to borrow my row the boat analogy, it's going to help steer, steer the ship. So, um, you know, this, th that's been a really, a really fun thing that we're, we're going to continue with uh, in the foreseeable future. And, you know, we're in, as we all know, we're in very weird times right now. And um, 
right now we're really gonna we've told our girls this before is whenever we come back this is going to be the ultimate test of as you were saying who's a doer who was still working who was trying to get better you know in these weird times when we can't have practices and um like choppa i know that we've been me you emily marlene all of us in our volleyball program we've been working our butts off trying to make this work for the girls and um what, Chapa, what do you think when it comes to doers right now? Because I really liked it. I want to know what you think about it. Well, to me, like you said, you have your four words and those are your pillars, right? And it's like, I mean, like when you said like a kid's doing something and you hear somebody yell, like that's a doer. Like just hearing you say that, I like got the chills. I was like, oh my gosh, like your boys are picking it up. Like, and you said like, it's a almost a smaller scope, but it's almost not a smaller scope. It's like, no, they're like, they're catching it. They're like on the same level, like whatever it means to them, they might word it a little differently, but like, it's there, it's present, you know? But like Luke was saying, so like we're in super weird times, like for volleyball or, or fall sports, I guess, fall and winter sports, we don't really know what's happening right now. Um, I don't really know how that affected your baseball season last season, but um like, yeah, what have you guys been up to since this whole COVID thing's happening? Like, how does that affect your, I guess, your last season, your postseason, your fall ball? Like, what's going on there? Yeah, so uh, we got shut down after nine games this year. Um, Damn, and that's out of 28, you said? Yeah, we, uh, yeah, we had 28 on the schedule. Um, we were 6-3 <laughs> and three when we got shut down. Um, two wins against probably the top two top four teams in our division. Um, so, you know, that, that was unfortunate. I was really excited about the group. Um, that we had uh, probably the most fun group that I had had yet. We were young. Um, I only we only graduated two guys um, this coming year, so we got most of them back. Um, but you know, it was, it was weird. We were supposed to actually head over to uh, over to the coast, the Central Coast. We were playing two games over at Santa Maria. We had one scheduled for a Friday and one on Saturday. And uh, Thursday night before, we got a call and said, "Hey, probably best not to travel." And Friday, we got a call and said, "Hey, we're shutting down school for." The rest of the year so um since they still had school that day um we practiced and did an inner squad um let the assistant coaches play in it to have some fun to reward <laughs> them a little bit too but just kind of a moment to be the last moment as a team um didn't know how long it would be till we'd see each other again um we started working back out the very end of june i believe um when stuff started clearing up a little bit fortunately um you know that's one of the benefits of the private school thing is we kind of can operate on our own um we're just using other schools and systems as a guide uh more so to protect ourselves um but as, as kind of a guide system so we did about six weeks of summer workouts um two times a week um organizing with football and basketball because they were doing workouts as well and as we mentioned earlier we're sharing athletes um it's been tough everything's had to be really distanced um, a lot of cleaning, mask wearing, and playing sports isn't the most fun, but it's what we got to do at the moment. So um, it allows us to be, at the moment, we're shut down right now and uh, just waiting to see what happens this fall. Um, you know, the unfortunate thing is we were a young team last year, um, and we only got nine games in with that young team. And so um, the goal now is to figure out how to make up for the, you know, approximately 20 games that we lost, um, that we didn't get to play. Um, because, you know, those sophomores and juniors need 20 more games of experience to be ready to go for this year. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm hopeful that at some point in the fall we'll get to play baseball. Um, you know, I'm imagining there's going to be some combination of playing against other schools as well as probably operating as, a, as an independent travel team, um, whatever it is, um, just trying to figure out how to get those games in. And then uh, Super fortunate for the outlook of the spring. The CIF released the, the new format for the schedule where we're pushed back into a March 22nd start date, I believe. Um, but I'm super fortunate, again, working with our football coach and our basketball coach that um, I think we're going to be able to have the kids ready. Um, you know, the, the windows between sports are really tight this year. Um, so I think that a lot of the, the chalk talk, a lot of the classroom stuff, um, learning plays, learning that sort of stuff, um, I think a lot of it's going to have to be done here in the fall because kids are going to be in football mode and then they're going to roll straight into baseball season. Um, in some regards, it's even overlapping. And uh, they made that new rule this year where they can play both sports at the same time. 
Um, so a kid technically could be in the middle of football season and still play a baseball game um, without even really being out there. So, um, and we might have some kids that we have to rely on to do that. So, uh, you know, at this point, it's the planning, how are we going to be, um, how are we going to have these kids mentally prepared um, to come out there? You know, they can, they can hit on their own. They can throw on their own. They could do all that stuff on their own. Um, but the mental side of it, knowing, you know, what to do in our situational plays and things like that, um, you know, that's going to be the planning as aspect that we're going to be um, figuring out this fall and, and understanding. Ho hopefully, like I said, we get some games in this fall um, because it's better to, to get that in um, live experience. But, uh, yeah, it's, it's uncertain for sure at the moment. Yeah. Mm. Little little bit off topic. Choppa, did you have anything else to say about that? No, no. Okay. A uh, little, little off topic, but um, the next thing we wanted to ask you is this is something I've been learning a lot about from coaching different levels in volleyball is um, as a varsity assistant coach, um, what are your expectations for both your assistant coaches and your lower level? I don't know if you guys have a freshman team, but I know you have a JV team. Mm -hmm. um, what, as a head coach, what do you want them to do to make your program better once they get up to you at the varsity level? Um, so at least personally, um, one thing that I would tell any of my assistant coaches is that I have you out here for a reason. Um, that I trust you as a person, um, both as a person that's mentoring a younger individual and also that is teaching our sport to this younger person. So, um, you know, my first expectation is for you to be present, um, not just there, but, you know, physically, but to be there mentally and be turned on. Um, you know, with enthusiasm um, and, and, and the, the teaching that, you know, I know you're capable of doing. Uh, you know, I, I, I would fully expect an assistant to do all the same things that I do in regards to forming relationships with players as far as, and, you know, communicating openly and honestly, um, you know, in, in all of those aspects. I think that one thing is special about the assistant coach role is I think that as an assistant coach, you do get to have a deeper bond with a smaller group of people. Um, you know, at least in baseball, um, you know, we're broken up by position with coaches. So I yeah. have my outfield coach, I have my pitching coach, I have my infield coach. Um, so for example, my infield coach, he gets to be a lot tighter with his infielders because those are eight guys that he's with every day, as opposed to me, where I'm dealing with, first off, our 20 varsity guys, but also our 15 JV guys on top of that. Um, you know, I'm trying to get as deep as I can with them, but sometimes, um, you know, in order to cover them all, we have to be a little bit uh, more shallow um, in the depth that we get to know them. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I, I expect them to to build those relationships and understand their players and, and be a resource uh, for them. Uh, you know, the other thing that I, I fully expect of them is, is to be students of the game themselves. Um, you know, I in no way have you know, a, even a small fraction of the baseball knowledge that's out there available. That's one thing that I love about um, coaching is that we get to continuously dive into conversations like this and learn from each other. Um, you know, I get to continuously dive into books and podcasts and conventions and um, always coming away with something new. And I, you know, even though they might not have the support to do it, whereas, you know, last year I was fortunate and our boosters program sent me to the National Baseball Coaches Convention in Nashville for a week. Um, and got to learn from all the college guys in person. You know, assistant coaches might not get that opportunity, but there's a ton of opportunities for you still to, um, you know, listen to some sort of podcast or, or search some sort of thing. Um, so that way you can come to practice, like I said, turned on and prepared, ready to go for that uh, portion of the day. Um, you know, the reality is I don't really believe that we have more than two hours of an of a adolescent's attention at a time. You get a practice past two hours, man, you're struggling. You're totally, yeah. totally <laughs> agree. The walls and, totally um, agree. So I try really hard from the moment that we're done stretching to the last drill to keep it as close to two hours as possible. Um, and then whatever they, however long they want to take to clean up the facility, that's on them. But, um, you know, so we're in this two hour window. Well, we have a lot of stuff to fit in there. Um, and so your time with your guys that you're hired to do, that you've been selected to do, be it coach and field, be it um, you know, coach pitchers or whatever, that's a pretty small window. You get 20, 25 minutes. So you need to have those 20, 25 minutes ready to go and know what you're doing. If, if, if I'm walking around and you're just standing around there, just, you know, 
talking with them about what you watched on TV last night or watching highlights on YouTube, well, there's going to be a problem. Or, but if you're, you know, dug in there with them doing work and have, have a plan, hey, I'm all for it. Um, I'm all for you coaching them the way you want to coach them, um, just that you have an idea behind what you're doing. Man, that's that. That's what this podcast is really all about. Like yes. you said about going to the convention and podcasts and reading. Like I've said this, quite, I've probably said this in every episode so far. I probably will continue to say it in every episode. Is we would never tell our kids to stop trying to improve and try to stop getting better. Why would we? Like, like you said, you 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 just acknowledge that you only know like a fraction of with the baseball information that's out there. I think every coach in every sport would say the exact same thing. There's information out there for us to go get. And we owe it to our kids to get better if we want them to totally. get better. Yeah. And yeah, it's well, right on. Yeah. Like, like you said, like, I mean, I totally think assistants should be students of the game just as head coaches and like everything else. Like Luke said, we should always be getting better. Like we would be foolish to think like, oh, my way has worked for two seasons, so I know what I'm talking about. Like, that's kind of crazy. Mm -hmm. So with that, I have a question for you, Shane. Um, What would your final advice to any coach be? um, Yeah, it's kind of broad. (laughs) if If you got to pick one piece of advice. You know, I would say you know, it, it's going to be really generic, but just continue to learn and be, you know, first, the first thing is going to be, um, if you're not passionate about what you're doing out here, you don't need to be doing it. Mm. Um, no part of mm-hmm. coaching, um, you know, until you get at least to the collegiate level. Um, and even then sometimes it's not, but no part of coaching a lower, you know, high school or, or younger is about, um, you know, a career choice. It's, what we do is vocational, it's not occupational. Um, you know, we, we, we sacrifice time, we sacrifice money, we sacrifice resources, um, because we love what we do because we love giving back. Um, when we love to, you know, the opportunity to make a difference, um, for, you know, the lives of the, of the athletes that we come across. So if you're not in that mindset, get out, um, because these kids deserve someone that is once you become passionate, you know, I would encourage you to check yourself often because if you're if mm. you're saying you're passionate and you're not doing these things if you're not learning if you're not growing you're not getting better you might not be as passionate as you thought you were so um you know just continuously challenging yourself challenging what you think think listening to people that do stuff differently than you um i think a podcast like this is fantastic because you're getting coaches that coach all different sports and um you know probably one of the best lessons that I learned my second year in Fowler I, I somehow walked into coaching JV football too um played one year of football in high school and somehow I accidentally coached it and as a you know after <laughs> college but uh the best thing that that did for me was it taught me coaching is coaching regardless of of what sport you're playing regardless if the ball is round or you know oval or or flat you know it's it's coaching is coaching and so you know, for us to be able to take ideas from each other and to grow and learn from each other, um, just, you know, never stop learning, never stop growing and never stop trying new things because, um, you know, the, the, the kids that you're encountering, um, you know, deserve it more than anyone else does. That's I awesome. love it. I love it. And, awesome. just, <laughs> and just, and just like you said, coaching is coaching. And I know we said that was like our little final uh, question, but I just wanted to say, you know, coaching is coaching that just nailed it because Shane, I'll be honest. I heard you say about five things today that I immediately was like, I need to do that with my team. And we don't even coach the same sport. Mm. Like it's there. You said multiple things today that I was just like, that's brilliant. And I need to use it. And I, for anyone that didn't listen to our first episode, Brian Kalpong said, you know, coaching is, you know, stealing stuff from other people and making it your own. Very, very similar to what you just said. Mm-hmm. So it's yeah, like the whole point of this whole thing. I love it. Yeah. So Shane, thank you so much for coming on with us today. It's been great talking to you. Yeah, um, no problem. Thanks for having me. This is fun. It was a great time. And also thank you to everybody again for, you know, supporting us and following us on everything. If you haven't um, followed us on social media, you can follow us at Instagram at comparing clipboards pod, Twitter at comparing clips. 
And if you don't like social media, it's all good because you can just email us at comparing clipboards at gmail.com. Um, email us any topics you want to hear, any guests you want to hear, um, and we'll get on it and we'll keep getting better just like we're saying here today. So, all right, guys, have a good one and we'll see you next time.